Okay. Well, Steve, if you're there, we'll, we'll segue immediately to you. Um, I am here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Um, in retrospect, I guess I, I should have... Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? In retrospect, if I had to use a smaller font like Howard did, we could get these all at, on one slide and look at them at the same time. Um, but they're broken up into two slides. On this first one, um, I think uh, you should get the sense um, by now from both Marilyn and um, Debbie's presentations that uh, uh, the consensus of, uh, of uh, our group was that discovery research should remain a, um, a high priority for the uh, future. And uh, working with the phenotyping group, uh, uh, one step is obviously to decide what traits or phenotypes uh, are uh, sort of high priority for the next phase of, uh, uh, of the network. And then the topic for discussion, and, um, and some of this has been occurring in the um, um, sort of uh, online chat, is um, uh, you know, whether or not uh, just go with existing data and uh, uh, work with uh, uh, improving the analytical tools and the methodology um, to use existing data or um, uh, whether there should also be some effort into um, denser data generation, whether it's by next-gen sequencing or, um, or uh, exon arrays. Um, as a sort of a non-genomic uh, person pursuing this more from a pharmacal uh, perspective, uh, I, I guess we could also add in that uh, the existing data could also include the uh, longitudinal phenotypes that uh, several people have alluded to. Uh, and using this in the context of, uh, you know, the genetic contribution to disease progression. This also lends itself uh, at uh, gene-environment interactions as well. Also, the impact of therapeutic interventions on, uh, on the trajectory of, uh, of progression. The, uh, the second part, point that came out of our uh, discussions was uh, this whole issue of, uh, of uh, not uh, uh, throwing the uh, the baby out with the bathwater, and looking at the importance of uh, of uh, rare variants, and again uh, up for discussion would be the uh, most appropriate uh, uh, platforms, whether it be a genotyping or a sequencing platform to capture them, but also um, resources that may need to be uh, put into developing appropriate tools to detect their effects. Is that the next slide? So this is um, this next point gets at uh, one of Debbie's uh, last points, and that is uh, uh, considering study designs other than a, a straight uh, GWAS type uh, format for discovery purposes. And uh, for example, uh, example that she gave, looking at discordant um, uh, extreme discordant phenotypes, at least for uh, uh, continuous variables, um, and coupling them with your um, uh, platform of interest, and I've put uh, whole genome uh, sequencing here. And, uh, you know, the potential for this uh, particular approach to be a little bit more efficient in, uh, in identifying uh, causal variants, and especially uh, rare causal variants. And then the last point that uh, our group would uh, propose to the larger group at whole would be, uh, again, something that was mentioned by both Marilyn and Debbie, and that is uh, looking at other sources of genomic material. Um, uh, RNA or going back into the DNA and looking at uh, uh, methylation, for example, for these uh, uh, genomic analysis. And then on the um, EMR side of things, uh, looking to see how uh, additional data can be captured or parsed to uh, look at uh, environmental factors and co comorbidities or uh, uh, gene by environment interactions, for example. So well, those are the four um, um, issues that were raised by our group as um, um, being something to, uh, to uh, pose to the rest of the group for, uh, for their thoughts and comments. And I'll toss it back to the chair. Okay. The, the floor is open for comments or, or questions uh, on uh, EMR and genomic discovery. Uh, Mark Williams here. Um, 
in, uh, I, I thought occurred to me as Debbie was talking, um, again, trying to bridge the uh, tension that we have between discovery and implementation. And this was in the context of the rare variants. I think one of the issues that we're all going to be dealing with as we uh, receive um, secondary findings from our um, uh, genomes, exomes, and high-density chips about, um, you know, that we're thinking about clinically returning is the uh, lack of information that we have on the um, uh, uh, impact clinically of some of these rare variants, even in genes that we know quite well. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing is to try and use our traditional methods of contextualizing that data using family history and other sorts of things to understand what's the potential impact. To me, that seems that uh, to lend itself to the idea that if we did a rare variant focus, we could study how we could use electronic health record mining to try and contextualize rare variant information to add additional information for clinical return and implementation. So that could be a potential um, a study topic for uh, eMERGE 3 that would bridge, again, this discovery and implementation um, uh, chasm. This is Dan Roden. Uh, I have to say Roden now because there's other Dan on the phone. Uh, um, I agree with Mark, but uh, at, a, at a practical level, I, I think you have to make some attempt to limit the minor allele frequencies down to which you're willing to go. If you find a rare variant that is one in a million or one in a hundred thousand, uh, it's going to be very, very tough unless you know something about the biology to assign any kind of phenotype to that. And so I. I think the, the sweet spot for us is probably minor allele frequencies around 0.1% plus variants in disease genes that are, you know, have been implicated. And as Zach said a couple of hours ago, uh, you find that variants that have been implicated as causes of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or channelopathies are actually much more common uh, than you give them credit when you start to look across very large populations, and we're finding that along with everyone else. So, so I think that, that uh, one thought is, is, is exactly which rare variants you would want to focus on. And I think that the variant of uncertain significance, this 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 1,000, is something that eMERGE is really, really well suited to attack. You know, if we're capturing sequence data, it seems to me that we should report all variants, even if we only see it once in 100,000 people, and put it in a database, because other people are going to be putting that data forward and annotating those variants, even if we can't determine ourselves alone if they're pathogenic, it's going to be really important going forward. I, so, Gail, I totally agree with that, uh, and, and that's what we're going to be doing in Emerge PGX. And, and, and as, the, as, as data accumulate worldwide, you can start to make some sense of that. But I think over the next five years, uh, it's it, a one in a million variant, unless there's some biology around it, it's going to be hard to make sense of. But we, yeah, I totally agree that we have to figure out a way of archiving this worldwide. So this is uh, Haukun here. Uh, so, <clears throat> as you know, the, um, the new platform from Illumina on the X10, uh, uh, which is currently tailored towards whole genome, I mean, it's very likely going to be adapted to exome, uh, even though that will probably take some time. Uh, but an exome could probably be sequenced for about $100, <clears throat> uh, sort of, uh, say, a year, year and a half from now. So in the interim, a strategy to sort of customize a chip uh, uh, with this rare variant content, particularly content that are sort of uh, um, uh, with potential or putative damaging impact or loss of function variance and so forth. And that can actually be typed now extremely cost efficiently across, uh, you know, uh, dozens of thousands of samples for a relatively uh, uh, sort of uh, low amount of money, even though it's going to cost some money. So, so in the interim, that would potentially be a very, very powerful strategy across all the sites because that would open up the rare variant content for all the phenotypes that we have, and we don't have that uh, today. So I w this is John Harley, Cincinnati. I just asked the question that when we concentrate on rare variants and we don't have all of our samples genotype, we rely on imputation. And as the frequency of the variant drops, the accuracy of the imputation is disastrous. 
And so how do we, you know, we don't, we aren't able to take advantage of our huge numbers because the error introduced by amputation is so big. Is there anybody that has a solution to this problem? You need to sequence. Yeah. 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 You need to sequence yeah. all those people. Yeah. Right. That'd be great. Okay. So this is Rex. I'd like to weigh in. I, I, I'd really like to endorse the idea of uh, thinking about environmental factors. We've played a little bit around with um, GIS tools. And I, and I think you know one of the things that we could do very well, which isn't done very well in most cases, is given the longitudinal nature of the people that uh, we're following, is to think about some of these environmental factors. I think there's going to be increased opportunities to capture some of these bits of data. Uh, Marilyn talked a little bit about uh, environmental protection agency think measurements that are being made. So I, I think to be able to start to tackle um, gene environment interactions using GIS approaches and some of these um, environmental measures is, is also something that would uniquely be uh, possible in an eMERGE 3 for, for us to take a look at. Well, this is Chris, and I, while I, I find that idea elegant, I, I, I want to make sure we're somewhat cautious and, and thoughtful about this. For some populations, and, and your Chicago population, Rex, might be a, a superb candidate for this. For other populations, they're not always, as we say, population-based, and hence the density of sample cases in any environmental geocode you, you run into power problems very quickly uh, with environmental association, particularly when you're treating it as a covariate and a substrate. Chris, this is Marilyn Ritchie. One of the other things that, that I think folks could think about, and, and this is something that Marshfield has done in Emerge 2, and that is to use the Phoenix Toolkit as a mechanism to collect environmental data. Um, we were awarded a, a supplement as part of the Phoenix Rising program by NHGRI, and so um, some of the Phoenix Toolkit measures were sent out to the eMERGE participants. And we've actually started mining that data, and we're finding really interesting gene environment results for type 2 diabetes and some for cataracts, and we only implemented a few of the Phoenix Toolkit measures. Um, that's something that, that other sites could do either electronically or paper forms, you know, it's something that you could port to an iPad that people could do in clinics. You could put it on the web that people could do through their My Health at Geisinger or Vanderbilt or what have you. Um, and that's another way that even without relying on population-based environmental data, you could collect it on the participants in the biobank. Well, I, I certainly agree that would be hugely more efficient and wouldn't, wouldn't suffer the, you know, broad association problem that you have with geocoding. Uh, <coughs> and I actually think the Phoenix Toolkits would be the appropriate choice for, for collecting that kind. So I agree with that. That's a good point. That, that might be another um, agenda item to put on the discussion with um, large health system providers when they're discussing it with, um, with uh, the vendors of health records because the patient portal is going to become a part of a, um, the man, uh, mandated um, electronic medical records eventually, and as they're building them, it would be nice to have patients uploading uh, various lifestyle things that can be merged with their electronic medical records. This is Terry. Um, one question is there, are there other things that the coordinating center should be working on in the future? I mean, they did an awful lot of work with data cleaning and then the imp uh, imputation. But are there other things that would make the data set more effective for other analyses that would be a good focus for eMERGE 3? So one focus there, this is how Con is, is um, on the copy number variation analysis because uh, that's another whole dimension that, uh, uh, you know, focusing there from the rare variant standpoint because most of the data is typed on Illumina. Uh, that can open up a, 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 a very fruitful sort of uh, uh, discovery uh, focus across all the um, phenotypes, again, uh, from a data mining uh, standpoint. And, uh, and algorithms can, you know, we have algorithms that can be applied uh, uh, on uh, uh, these data at the individual sites or, or, or uh, jointly, and then the whole thing just sort of uh, uh, meta-analyzed together. Yeah, this is Terry. I, I did want to ask about the, the issue of sequencing. When, when we've approached, 
approach sort of large-scale sequencers, um, the, the question they often ask is, well, how many cases of a given disease do you have? Because um, they're very interested in looking at, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of cases of disease X. And, and that has not been something that Emerge has, has really focused on because we're sort of phenomic, as it, as it were. So, so how do we address that question um, other than say, gee, we've got so many wonderful phenotypes, isn't this just as good or better? So Gail, you... Uh, so I, I think we don't need to have a disease focus. I'd be really excited to sequence the 56 ACMG genes. Um, we know what those genes do, but we don't know what the variants in those genes do. And we could look both for variant annotation, pathogenic, and importantly, not pathogenic. Everybody's going to have sequence variants. It's a matter of what they do. Um, and then we could also look for pleiotropic effects of those same genes. So there's a discovery possibility there, too. And then there's lots of implementation questions. How do you, you know, let me tell you, my health system is very concerned about those 56 genes now because of the ACMG recommendations. Um, so how do you implement that? How do you give decision support? How do you educate providers? What do patients want to know? What do they need to see? You know, I think it really hits all the things that we can do really well. And having those phenotypes um, that we have so in such depth gives us a unique resource for, for that kind of annotation. And I think even at the pediatric sites, there is really important work. That, you know, 49, I think out of the 56, that have pediatric phenotypes. Um, plus, the pediatric sites really could look into this idea of mandatory return of adult onset findings to children, which has been a hugely controversial recommendation, and they could really ask their family, what do they want? Ask their providers what they want. So I think that that is a space where there's a lot of controversy, a lot of interest for the health system, and we have a really unique capability. And I don't think sequencing 15 I would add a couple more, by the way, but <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree with Gail. I think that there no, this, no, is I, Irwin, I, this is Irwin. I, I, that one could add to such a panel, I think, which would be extremely meaningful and uh, something that can be done uniquely in Emerge. Things like uh, uh, a list of the highly penetrant uh, uh, forms of diabetes, highly penetrant monogenic forms of diabetes, and others. I think which you know it would be very helpful to understand uh, among sort of common complex diseases what forms are diagnosable on a, on a molecular level and uh, to what extent is that, to how frequent that is. So, so I'd be interested in, in Steve Leder and, and uh, Debbie Nickerson's comments on, on that. Let me just, just ask, you, both of you had, had pointed toward non-coding variation and, and here we're talking about really focusing on, on genes even though there are some non-coding regions obviously in, in the intron. So Steve or, or Debbie, any thoughts? Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's great to, to look broadly at genes, um, but I think that different platforms have different uh, outcomes in terms of what you'd look at. I mean, many people are sequencing a whole genome, but they end up looking at only the coding and, and that few percent that are well annotated by ENCODE uh, as being highly functional. But I, you know, I think broadly whole genome is an important route to go because you can look at variants that are difficult to look at like indels and CMVs by just sheer capture. Thanks. Steve, what, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, non-coding for me really uh, points more to um, um, regulatory regions uh, as being of interest. Uh, but you have to understand I'm coming at this from a, a pediatric perspective uh, uh, as well, in that uh, when we are looking when we are looking at things in kids, there's so much um, change that is going on between birth and and uh, sort of adulthood that uh, you know you have to look somewhere somewhere besides the coding region of the uh, of a gene for for what's changing as kids grow and develop. And uh, you know to some extent, um, 
we, we know very little about um, how this really works in uh, senescing adults as well as we move towards uh, um, a geriatric population. So for me, the, the non the non coding stuff really uh, I, I'm I'm really thinking about uh, uh, important regulatory regions and being able to identify those and and characterize them. Steve, this is Dick Winchelbaum. In all of our studies of variation in cancer drug response, the majority of the hits that are functionally important regulate transcription. They're non coding regions. So so this is, this is very brilliant. Um, I think that it's, it's clear that from an economic standpoint, we can't do whole genome sequencing of 50,000 people, and, 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 but, but we, could, uh, we could look at, 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 at a smaller number of genes. And since these genes have been you know, implicated in, in human disease, they're reportable, they're actionable. We can look both at exomes and, and introns. I, I think that if we focused on on a subset su subset of genes, uh, you know, it, it would be a paradigm for for looking at the whole genome. I mean, it, it just it, it would be scalable. And I think that you know, there's the 50 some genes here. Maybe you know, all of us have some other favorite genes. If we if we had a hundred genes, it's kind of catchy. Instead of thousand genomes, we have a hundred genes that are looked at in in, in across a, a large number of people. And, and again, this would be as a, as a paradigm, what, what are we going to do uh, when we have a large number of whole, whole genome sequences? It, this, this really uh, cuts across all of that. I, I would point out that's very reminiscent of the decision early on with the ENCODE project to tackle 1%. I mean, I don't know if I like this idea or not. That's a separate issue. Sure, sure. But it is reminiscent that the same rationale went in and we can't we ever going to interpret the whole human genome. So there was a whole process to pick the 1%, which was probably complicated, but we got there. Everybody studied the 1% until you felt comfortable enough to scale up to the whole genome. Mm -hmm. So this would be, be a, a similar circumstance, it, however many genes you pick. I think you could also emphasize diversity here. So you have a specific set of genes that um, there's a particular interest in reporting results back, but also possibly data for minority populations. For Which is a crisis. I know. Okay. So yeah. I, I think we could do really well in that avenue. So, so is the idea to do non-coding as well, right, of those genes? Yes. Well, I think if you could find that, yeah. So if you know the regulatory regions of them, sure. Well, I'm just going to clarify. Yeah. I mean, would you, what would you, you would take a gene and you would just go end-to-end, -end, maybe X number of bases upstream and downstream and just do the whole segment? Yeah, I mean, as opposed to known, I mean, what Terry was implying was sort of known functional non-coding well, regions. I would, I'm just uh, trying to stimulate the conversation maybe towards exome versus uh, targeted panel. So what's the difference there? If you get exome really cheap. What's the difference? I mean, it's not even clockwise or it's technical. These are, actually, these are actually asking very different questions. You're making, if you're only going to go exomes, you're going to make the assumption that that's what you're going to find. And anyway, I thought the idea was that you have these types of genes that are of interest that's on the variance of the encoding, so only a non-coding, so only, and you want to get a complete inventory deep in lots of people. So that's deep. what I wanted you to say, Eric. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to re-articulate what I thought I heard. So it was not, but what I, what I also heard was a variance approach, which was you take the X, you take X number of genes, and you take all the exons, but then you take... Well, or, and the introns. But and the introns. Any regulatory right. regions you know it's, of. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the introns or well, else. And this regulatory else, oh, well, to no. the extent you knew them. Yeah. I mean, there are some that have regulatory regions that are identified in other chromosomes, you know, and so maybe look at those as they become, you know, added in. But, you know, it takes two years, Debbie, or, or more to develop a targeted platform like this? No, I think it's much easier now than it was. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't think it's, I think we have a lot more experience. And I think the PGRN has great data with the PG X C uh, they could look at these questions. Debbie, what do you think of molecular inversion from versus the next gen? You know, I think it's a matter of cost and uh, cost and ease of implementation. I think some can be cheap, but uh, whether they're broadly applicable to many genes is not known. Mm -hmm. 
If okay, we we'll get this the car. car. If we put this into into an RFA, <laughs> I I would suggest that uh, we could be agnostic as to the technique and let the um, people that are putting in proposals uh, discuss how they would do it. Because as was pointed out, there are a number of us that are going to be generating large numbers of exomes and genomes. And so that would also allow then for a, a methodologic comparison about what's the best way to actually do it. OK. Uh, and we're going to need to wrap up the discussion at the car here. Just a very good point that um, there are these uh, uh, commercial um, uh, entities that are trying to uh, make these panels of two or 3,000 genes so that if you have a patient with Marfan or if you have a patient with hypertrophic, you just order that set. And then you can just pick and choose and analyze. Because what's happening is that you know, we're realizing that there are many variants that may cause, for example, an aneurysm. And so I end up ordering a panel of 15 candidate genes, which is like $5,000. And I may still not get the information, because they may just do st certain variants or not. So I think you know, that's another, you know, it's not in the whole exome, but it's like, what are the 1,000 or 100 or 1,500 genes that are most often used in the clinical setting, and perhaps go with those. And also, it would go back to Debbie's point that if you're using some of these in the clinical setting, you would have the familiar structure to interpret the variants much more efficiently. OK, so I'd like to thank all of the participants for actually all of our panels this morning um, for a very rich and uh, thoughtful discussion for future directions in eMERGE. And we're going to, I guess we're down to uh, about a 20-minute break uh, for lunch. Be so, careful because you're not going to get all these people down to the cafeteria and through the cafeteria back up here in 20 minutes. We'll do our best. Okay. Uh, so we'll we'll plan to start uh, somewhere around uh, half past the hour. Um, the idea is these folks should get their lunch. Yeah, everybody the out there, uh, yeah, on the call should go run for lunch and bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> on the first floor here, you come up.